morning, everybody, and welcome. It's lovely to have you at our school. Every opportunity we get, we like to have parents in. We want to make ourselves like a whole community, like the saying that a village raises a child. So these sort of opportunities to bring you in and then visit the classroom are great for building a common understanding into how we're going to grow our children to be happy and successful in their lives. Uh, when I told some parents that we were going to teach this lesson about maths, they were saying, are you going to share some of your methodology about how you teach addition at the school or multiplication? Uh, I hope it's not a disappointment to you, but we won't be covering that today. We've actually dealt with that in some of our other parent academies, and I'll be happy to share some links with you for some of our recorded sessions. But today what we're going to be talking about is possibly even more important than that. We're going to be talking about self-confidence in that. And it's predicated upon a couple of uh, psychological phenomena that are well documented, observed, and researched. And one of these is called the Pygmalion Effect, where people have a tendency to fulfill the expectations that those around them have of them. So if children go up to believe that, that with the people around them think, well, maths is not really my child's talent, it's not really their thing, that will have a tendency towards becoming true. They won't believe in themselves as much. Which leads us to the second psychological phenomenon, which is people have a tendency towards fulfilling the expectations that they have of themselves. And it's been recorded in percentages in terms of performance. If you would tell someone, wow, you're really high IQ, your leadership potential tested off the charts, if they believe you, they will act a different way. They will act like that, that leader who knows what they're doing and they will get better results. If we can help our children to believe in themselves, to become self-confident, to be excited by a math lesson, and to really believe that with hard work and focus they can master it, they will achieve results that will really amaze you. So that's what we're going to talk about today, what strategies we can do together in the classroom and at home. Before we start, I would just like to share our mission with you. So our mission here at this school, it's on our website, is that every student who loves coming to school develops a passion for learning and achieves more than they ever thought possible. I hope you can agree those are really great aims. If they develop that love and that passion, they're going to keep engaging with maths and their other learning, even beyond school, beyond the classroom. But actually, both of those also, these aren't three separate things, they feed one into the other. A child who loves learning and has a passion for learning is the child that will go on to achieve more than they ever thought possible. I want to show you some statistics as we get started as well. We do some standardized testing at this school. We do it not so much to judge and measure the children. We don't do it for that reason. We do it to judge and measure ourselves as a school and to hold ourselves accountable for the service that we give to the children. In an average school, in the standardized test, a child would test in the 50th percentile. This is done in private schools uh, around the world, or British schools in the UK as well. In our school, they actually test on the 87th percentile, not just in the last year, but year after year. And it's surprisingly resilient that score as well. I had a lot of phone calls from parents who were really worried during COVID. They said, what's going to happen is my child's achievement rate's going to dip. It didn't dip. This last year, we had a lot of instability, some friends and families moving. It was very difficult for the children. And we worried about the results. In maths, I can tell you, it didn't dip. It went to about the 86th, 85th percentile. Remarkably resilient. How did that happen, that the children were able to keep up with their learning even amidst very challenging contexts like that, where even adults found it difficult. Uh, I'm sharing this with you. I don't want to do a sell. You're already here in our school. But I don't want to build confidence with you so, so that you really hear us on how we do that, because it might not be exactly the way you think. We like to be very warm and caring towards children in our lessons. We even give them a lot of choice in their lessons. If you rewind, you know, years ago, we used to have them in ability groups so that we could serve them well. So, okay, this activity is for you today, this one is for you, you can try some really hard stuff, and we'll tell them what to do. Now we like to give more choice, so when they feel ready for something harder, or if they need to consolidate a bit more, the choice is a little bit more theirs. Uh, they tend towards choosing something that's challenging for them, and that ability to do that will serve them very well when they go to secondary and on into employment. You want people who are confident to challenge themselves, and the other big factor is you. It's not just about having great lessons in the classroom. It's about building attitudes at home so that they do believe in themselves, so that they're excited about these things. Hence why we've invited you in today as well. You're an extremely important part of this process, and we can see your influence on great results. Interestingly, when I looked at those results, I did a study a while ago with children who were in year five when I used to be working on a primary. And I wanted to find out 
Uh, this is back when we had ability groups. I wanted to find out what's the difference between the children in each group who are achieving higher than the average, and you can imagine how high that is, uh, about on the average for the class or below it. And the biggest difference, I looked at everything, about language ability, about you know uh, where they came from, their background, other things. The biggest difference maker was how long they'd been at the school. In that stage, I noticed a big difference where if they'd been with us for four years or more, they were very likely to be towards the top end. So those attitudes, as we instill them over the years, really have a big impact. We have our priorities straight as well. It's a tendency towards parents, I think, myself included, and other schools, to focus really heavily on the academic development. So make sure the lessons are great, push them into lessons. And we do have great lessons, and we do challenge the children. But it's like having a great driver for a Formula One team. Yeah, it's really important to have a great driver in a Formula One team. But we need to see what's going on beneath the surface. We need, you, if you're going to win a Formula One, you need to have a whole team working on building a high performance engine. The same thing for children. We need to focus first and foremost on what's going on beneath the surface. Make them calm and confident in their lessons. Build their character so that they can be balanced, you know, work hard in the lessons, go outside and play and have fun. And that way they can have control over their lives and happiness over their lives. Over their lives. And it just so turns out that children who are really courageous, resilient and focused don't want to get great results. I'm going to introduce you to one of my favorite psychologists. This is Dr. Angela Duckworth. She's been a major influence over what we do here. And I was watching a TED Talks of her recently. She used to be a teacher, and then she went out to research. What is the difference, and I mean amongst adults as well as children, between people who are successful and achieving what they want, and people who are less successful? I'll let her talk for herself for the next minute. Do listen, this is very interesting. I started studying kids and adults in all kinds of super challenging settings. And in every study, my question was, who is successful here and why? My research team and I went to West Point Military Academy. We tried to predict which cadets would stay in military training and which would drop out. We went to the National Spelling Bee and tried to predict which children would advance farthest in competition. We studied rookie teachers working in really tough neighborhoods, asking which teachers are still going to be here in teaching by the end of the school year. And of those, who will be the most effective at improving learning outcomes for their students. We partnered with private companies asking, which of these salespeople is going to keep their jobs? And who's going to earn the most money? In all those very different contexts, one characteristic emerged as a significant predictor of success. And it wasn't social intelligence. It wasn't good looks, physical health, and it wasn't IQ. It was grit. Grit is passion and perseverance for very long-term goals. Grit is having stamina. Grit is sticking with your future, day in, day out, not just for the week, not just for the month, but for years, and working really hard to make that future a reality. So grit or resilience is a major predictor of success. When I worked years ago, I thought, this needs to be part of the curriculum. We should really be teaching this. When you go to your classrooms today, have a look around. You should see all the success skills. We went ahead and looked at other researchers, and we built our 10 success skills, where if we can train the children in those, they're going to be really successful. When I say successful, I don't mean earning more money. I mean having control over their life and being able to steer in really great directions that will, that will make them happy. Um, so look for those success skills in the class. We also developed a point system where we can reward them when we see incidences of, for example, being resilient. Because it's easy to be discouraged in this high-performing atmosphere, especially for new children coming from around the world. Maybe they struggled with the language at first. Maybe they're fine for their age group at the 60th or 70th percentile, but it's so easy for them to feel like they might be falling behind if they compare themselves to their peers or if they worry what other people are doing. We need to develop that individual drive and focus. So, you know, learning numbers is a big challenge. It's so easy for us as adults to take for granted that we can look at that chart and we can immediately see a lot of patterns there. We've, you could probably name five different patterns you're seeing on that board right away. We're very familiar with them. But if I showed you this, you, you would probably struggle a bit more to spot any patterns there to see what's going on. It just squiggles on the screen. So that's actually a number system from the Cherokee tribe of Native Americans. Imagine if I had to teach you that. How long would that take? How many mistakes would we make as part of the process? 
what would happen if you were afraid to make mistakes and held back on participating unless you were sure you would get it correct. Your progress would be a lot slower. It's really challenging. That's what our children are facing, especially in these young years. If you could imagine, imagine this, imagine you uh, clean up your house for your spouse, you know, you're at home, your spouse, your husband or wife is out for the day at work or, or whatever, uh, and you really want to make them happy, so you clean the entire house, top to bottom, really, you really think it'll make them happy, uh, maybe you forget, like let's say, I've seen, I've seen a video on this, the dog hair on the rug, maybe you just forget it, uh, but everything else is looking amazing, you work so hard, your partner comes home, they look around the house, or what's with the dog hair on the rug there? Well, good luck getting you to do that again. You just showed so much good behavior, but you won't repeat it. You'll draw back into your shell, and, and probably that will never happen again. Imagine if they come back and say, Whoa, this is amazing. You know, this is fantastic. Wow, I can't believe it. You've absolutely made my day. I'm so touched. You're probably going to do that again, and you will learn, and you will get better at it probably, but you will tend to repeat those behaviors. As human beings, we have to be aware that we are psychologically predisposed to noticing what's wrong and trying to fix it. And it can have a detrimental effect. I think it goes back to caveman times or something. If you're walking in a jungle and something's out of place and not right, you have better pay attention to it. It might be that there's a tiger over there and you notice it and that is a big influence on, on whether you survive and how you evolve. But if you're looking at someone's workbook or homework, for example, what do you see? Here's a child, this is, this is from year three actually, I think. So they're working on some things here. You might think, well, that's a bit simple for year three, I'm not sure, they're making some mistakes. We go, we want to correct it because we want to help. You know, the things that are doing correct, we tend to ignore because you don't have to do anything. You know, they go to drive, we don't have to do anything there. I want you to flip that thinking and praise them. What I see is a child who's pushing themselves to the limit. Remember I told you they get a lot of control over what level of difficulty they choose, so they're, they're operating at, a, at a, an edge of difficulty that, that's pushing the boundaries of what they're capable of. Good for them, that's behavior you'd want to repeat, that's how you grow fast and learn a lot. So there's a lot there to praise, and by the way, look at them, this is probably, this, this is probably a couple of weeks ago, you can see it's from the 25th of January, so really only about eight academic, week, academic weeks later, the same child, it's getting a lot harder. It's getting a lot harder, they're getting more right. And look, you can see about halfway through the lesson, they push themselves to much more difficult work. Super, and they got some of it right, they weren't 100% confident about all of it, but they feel confident, they're ready, the teacher will help them, they will master it, I know they will be. If I had more photos on a couple of weeks later, it would amaze you how much progress they could make in that time with that behavior. So rather than focusing in and correcting their mistakes, Try to notice all those character things, all those behaviors. Try to notice the rest of the house that's going really well and praise that. And they'll repeat that behavior and they'll do things that are great for you. Maybe they will clean your house, but they'll definitely you know, be focusing hard on their work and they'll be proud of what they are doing. And that's how you get great progress. So you focus your feedback. You develop an eye for the things that are going right. A question, and I get this one a lot. Well, they say, well, okay, should I correct my child's homework or not? Uh, that's a very tricky question to answer because we want to be helpful, we want to correct misunderstandings. If you want to, you can leave it to us as teachers. You can send the teacher a message and raise it with us, and we'll do it in our way, and, and you can focus on the praise if you want to. And sometimes that is the best way. Uh, if you want to correct them, sure. But just act the way that you would want someone to act towards you if you cleaned the whole house but made a mistake here. It'd be very praising. Well, you worked on that by yourself. Praise their independence. They tried some tricky work. Great courage. If they pushed through, if they made some mistakes and kept going, excellent resilience. That's great. Reward them for the behaviors more than you reward them for the correctness. If you reward the correctness, they will try to be correct. They will try the easier ones. And, you know, they won't push themselves as much because the number one thing you want is for them to be correct. They'll give you whatever you put your attention on. Children, people are highly sensitive to attention. You know, partners, adults, very sensitive to attention. Children are dependent on you for their survival and they know it. So they're hyper linked in to whatever you want and they will try to make you happy. If just trying hard or doing a lot of work makes you happy or helping around the house, they'll tend to do it more. Um, the other thing is, I've heard it said that when you're organizing your home, you shouldn't have your office workspace somewhere like your bedroom or your living room if you can help it. 
because it mixes together your home life and your work life. It's hard to escape work. Children are at school, let's say from as early as 8 o'clock in the morning, and they go home, and maybe they arrive home at like 4 o'clock. That's a pretty long working day, actually, for a 6-year-old to manage, for a 7-year-old to manage. So they work pretty hard that day. If your boss gave you work to take home as well after a full working day, you know, it, it is a lot, and we have to be sensitive about that as well. Maybe they don't want to mix their home life and their school life together that much. So if they go and they do their homework, even if they make some mistakes, you don't have to mix your roles. If you see that they're making some mistakes, you can bring it to our attention. We'll take care of the teaching. You can be a parent. Just have fun praising them. Wow, you did that way so great independence. Praise them for all those character things, and you will see great results. If you, don't, if you want to be the corrector, do it. But if you want to just enjoy being a parent and keep your home relationship in that manner, you're welcome to do that too. What if, okay, so some parents have said, yeah, my child challenges themselves. I can see at school they're trying hard. When they do their homework, they try the easiest ones and they're not really trying. They just get it done and they're out the door. I get that one a lot as well. So what can we do about that? We thought of two possible reasons why they might be doing that. Number one, I've spoken about a little bit. Maybe they don't feel safe taking risks. Maybe they know if they try the harder ones that we as parents are going to be there handpicking. Oh, I see something you've done here. Can you fix that up? Would you clean the house if your partner was saying, Oh, I think you missed a spot there. Could you get that for me? You probably wouldn't like to do it that much. It'd be easier just to clean something easier. So if we make it safe and easy for them to take a risk, they will tend to do it more. Maybe that's not it. Maybe they're just clever. Maybe they realize if they do the easy ones, they can be out the door and playing much quicker. So you at school, they're going to do maths for 50 minutes in their lesson, no matter what. So it makes more sense to use your time and just challenge yourself a bit more. So you could say, okay, you know, tonight, oh, you know, great job if you do your homework for 10 minutes, but it's going to be 10 minutes no matter what. So you take away the incentive to rush through it, okay? They might tend to challenge themselves some more. But be aware that the behaviors they show in the home environment and school environment might be different. Might be different. That's why we sometimes send home our workbooks so you can look at their workbooks and praise them for the work they do at school as well. And one of the last things I'd like to talk to you about is familiarity with maths. Those numbers on the screen that I showed you earlier, those squiggles, they mean nothing. They mean nothing at all unless they have a link to the real world. The number 60 has no meaning unless we're thinking about 60 or something, 60 dollars, 60 apples. So we want maths when they encounter it in the classroom to feel almost like an old friend. You know, something that they understand what it means, that they're motivated to try. So I recommend looking for opportunities to engage with maths in your home and just the real world. You can take your child shopping. You can give them 500 rubles of their own to spend in the shop on what foods they would like. Encourage them to be healthy. But then they'll start thinking if they have enough money for some crisps and some, I don't know what else they would like to buy as well. Give some broccoli or something they would love to buy. You know, telling the time, having a schedule or a clock set up that's just for them, setting their own alarm, measuring things. It's very hard even for children in year three, four, and five to read scales correctly, but maybe they really enjoy cooking. Lots of children love to get involved in like cooking or baking where you have to measure things or measure spoonfuls. So look for these opportunities. If you have a height chart, children love to track their height. It's basically like having a number line in their bedroom that they can engage with. Just build their familiarity so when they come across these things in the classroom, they don't separate, well, maths is something you do in the classroom, everything else is out there. They just see how what they're learning joins together with real life. They'll be more confident because they know what it all means. And they'll believe in their ability to learn. One of my favorites is giving an allowance as well. If you want a child to count, if they're counting their own allowance, they'll count it very carefully. If you really want to up-level as they get older, you can encourage saving targets or even act as a bank. When I was growing up, we had a state bank in Australia that had children's accounts. So back in the days when you would go into the bank and talk to a person more often, you know, they would give you a little book, they would give you some rewards for meeting saving targets and so on. You can simulate that at home. You could even give them interest on their savings. Then they'll know why it's important to learn about percentages in a way that they might not otherwise. But you know, children love having responsibilities like that as well. And the last thing I'd like to mention to you as well is attendance actually does matter. It's difficult for a child. You can imagine, I, I illustrated before what a high performing environment the classroom can be. And it's very difficult for them if they're sort of in one day and out the next and don't build up the same momentum. It's hard to learn fractions under the best of conditions. 
but if they come into the classroom, everyone else has been learning fractions for a couple of days and you're catching up, it can knock your confidence back and forth a little bit. I understand children get ill sometimes, but if you're able to maintain uh, a consistent attendance as much as possible, maybe keeping holidays to within the holidays, you know, I'm not one to say, you know, your grandpa's turning 70 years old, you can't go, I like family gatherings, but as much as possible, if you're able to maintain consistency, it will also help. The average UK child has 93.5% attendance, and our school the average is 81.6. Now, my maths might be a little bit off, I didn't do maths at ISM growing up, but um, I think that means that by the end of year 8, they will have missed an entire year of education compared to uh, their UK peers. And that's a lot to maintain. We're really asking a lot of them, if we're asking them to like learn and perform at a high level, whilst missing so much school. And that's if they're average at the school. If they're a little bit below, if they're like at 70%, then by the end of year three, they'll have missed an entire year of school. And that's if we're starting at year one. So anything you can do to maintain consistent attendance will, will really help them and will really help them feel that confidence. That's a summary of what I've spoken about. Thank you so much for coming. I'll leave that up a little bit later as well so you can take a, a photograph on your way out. We're going to keep delivering great lessons. We do focus on that academic development, but we do it with children who are enjoying their learning, who have strong characters, who just feel great about themselves and what they can achieve, and knowing that the people around them believe in them and are there first and foremost to support them. So thank you very much for coming. Yeah.